Uh, welcome, everybody. There's a lot of you on the call, and um, we are very, very happy to have you on this call. So my name is Jim Schwartz. I'm director of PFR and Agronomy here at Bex Hybrids, and with me I have three guys who I think you will really uh, find very knowledgeable, passionate about herbicides and everything herbicides. So with me, first of all, is Joe Bolte. Joe is a PFR technician herbicide specialist from Effingham, Illinois. Uh, Joe is a Missouri boy. Uh, he got his, uh, his master's in weed science over uh, under Dr. Bradley. Uh, I have Austin Scott. Uh, Austin's from, you will, you will hear it in his voice, he's from Wisconsin. So, um, no, actually Austin lives in Tennessee and his master's is in weed science. Uh, I think it was Dr. Steckel at Tennessee, am I right, Austin? Uh, yes, sir. Dual majors, agronomy and weed science. There you go. And then uh, Luke Schulte. Luke joins us from uh, Cedarville, Ohio. Um, Luke, I don't remember what your degree's in. That's terrible. I'm getting old. Uh, agronomy. That's okay. That's all right. There yep. you go. But uh, Luke has tons of experience in uh, herbicides, and these are the three guys that put together the herbicide brochure for you all. Um, and again, they have a lot of passion around herbicide yeah. and herbicide information. So, okay, you know what? We've got our first question. So we're going to ask this one. Um, Here he is. Yeah, forget it. Let's see. Let's see. Austin, I'll start with you. Has anyone seen the Extend Flex? In fact, Joe, I'm going to start with you because the word labels in it. Has anyone seen the Extend Flex label? And this webinar suggested that there will be some mixing restrictions that will make it more restrictive than the Enlist label. Joe, got any insights on that? So, so currently what we're kind of going by, I guess what the, the theory behind it is, you know, we got to look at the Tank Mix Partner websites, and we, of course, know that uh, the new dicamba formulations, we can't Tank Mix uh, Liberty with them. So whether we're talking Genia or Extendamax, and a lot of that's to do with the ammonia base and that Liberty. So currently, um, there's no no plans. I don't want to say no plans, but currently it wouldn't be possible because of that ammonia in the Liberty. So there's going to probably be more of a heck make separate applications um, when we're talking about whether dicamba. So this could be maybe um, spray and Xenia or Extendamax early, and then come back in the post trip a little bit later with the Liberty in a separate application. Luke Austin, any add, any other comment? Yeah, I'll I'll touch it touch in a little bit here, Jim. Uh, this is Austin. So, uh, Brent, I think you asked that question. So, uh, Extend Flex, uh, obviously, is just the technology. Uh, we've already got the the herbicides on the market that will be used for that technology. Uh, so the the Extend Max label and Genie label are up for review at the end of this year. So we'll see what those look like coming uh, coming out towards the first of the year. But what I'll say is we've been growing Extend Flex cotton in the South for about four years now. Uh, so the, the tank mixing issues are not that big of a deal. Uh, like I said, I, I know we're going to get probably get a few more restrictions this year after the Extend label goes, or the Extend Max and Ingenia labels go up for review. Uh, but as far as the technology goes, we've been growing the technology in cotton for four years now. Um, and, and we've had a lot of success with it. Uh, when tank mixing blue glide combinations, uh, there's going to be issues, like Joe said, with or restrictions, I think, that, that don't allow uh, Liberty and Dicamba uh, tank mixing options. So. Great. Luke, anything to add I'll there? Just add, I just want to add one thing that, you know, if you look at platforms in the future, they're all going to have, generally speaking, Liberty as a, as I'll say even kind of a foundational post uh, uh, you know, product and, and uh, availability. That said, the Extend Flex is going to go a long way uh, to preserving the, the effectiveness of Liberty uh, with a strong residual, along with dicamba down, maybe pre, uh, and then not having to always be totally reliant on uh, you know the dicamba post. It'd be an option, but not over reliant. Okay, good. So just a reminder: as you join, we have a lot of folks on. If there's um, any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box, and uh, I will read them off. Uh, it should be, I think, on the there's a bar, the third bubble from the right. Maybe it looks like kind of like a speech bubble. You just type in there, and um, we will uh, we will 
we will get you going. Uh, so uh, let's see. I'm going to ask another question there. Um, let's see. Austin, uh, how long can my residual herbicide go without rain activation before losing efficacy? Uh, so, Jim, I get this question every year, and it's a it's a big talking point actually in in post applied systems. You know, typically uh, middle of the summer or you know, early summer when when we're hitting those dry periods, uh, guys want to say, "Well, I'm not going to put my my residual in because if it doesn't rain, then it's wasted." Uh, and this is a conversation I have every year, uh, and it it is a valid point that they don't want to waste money. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I say, well, what if it does rain and your pre herbicide's broke? Uh, well, then then you have an extremely weedy field. Uh, so, long uh, long way to answer that question, Jim. Typically, I give residual herbicides about 10 to 14 days um, before you really start seeing a lot of reduced efficacy uh, without rainfall activation. So, if you're spraying like a Group 15 herbicide, dual warrant residual outlook, something like that. Uh, Ten days goes by, and you haven't got a, at least a, you know a quarter to a half inch of rain cumulative by then. Uh, you start seeing some some loss of that residual product. Uh, Joe, any comment there? Yeah, I completely agree with Austin there, and that's you know kind of think about more of that in season time. Um, you know, some of the different group 15s, maybe one takes such as Outlook, maybe, you know, it takes a little less water to get activated versus a, a Zidua type of product. So um, we can see maybe differences on the amount of water, but yeah, like Austin said, you know, that 10 to 14 days, um, we're hoping we get a rain and get those products activated to give us another residual barrier. And, and Jim, I, I, I want to add there, that's cumulative rainfall. So if you, if you pick up one tenth a day, two tenths or two tenths uh, two days from now that's three tenths total uh, so it's a cumulative uh, rainfall amount okay um, Luke while we're um, why we are talking uh, about this how do how do I balance uh, we're talking about trees how do I balance having a strong residual program without sacrificing you know emergence or crop response uh, how do I do that yeah so like Jim mentioned earlier, I'm from Ohio, so generally speaking, we don't get uh, over this direction. We generally get plenty of rainfall to activate things. We worry more on the side of crop safety and some of those things. So, uh, you know, it makes sense, but the sooner we can get that pre out there, that allows for that uh, decomposition and breakdown of some of that residual herbicide so that the persistence right at the you know, depth of seeding and, and shallower isn't so strong. Variety selection actually can help too, and generally speaking, when varieties are um, better at tolerating wet conditions and, and wet feet, that tends to lend itself to also being able to metabolize herbicides uh, as well. Please don't ignore plant backs. I know in, in our world of Roundup Ready and now Liberty Link and Freedom Plus and Extend and, 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 and Enlist 2, um, it's easy to, to not it's easy to maybe think, well, there's a lot of safety net built within the labels. Um, just be mindful of plant backs, whether it's 240 or even when you, when you put uh, two group 14, so that's your sharpens, that's your valor, that's your sulfentrazones. Um, when you put sharpen with one of those, your plant back goes up to 14 to 30 days, I believe it is. Please be mindful of those. But, uh, and then planting depth has a significant impact too. It says right on many of our herbicide labels, you know, plant an inch to inch and a half, many of them say an inch and a half deep so that that uh, herbicide and, and that where that seeds and biving are taken in water aren't at the same level, uh, which we tend to see more crop response with shallow planted and, and those type of situations. Joe, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this one at you. Um, it's it's two, two part question. It says, what about 2,4-D in with lead off as a burn down in front of corn? And then the second question is mare's tail control in the absence of an auxin. How many days in front of the planter? So I'll read them again. Uh, what about 2,4-D in with lead off as a burn down in front of corn? And then the second one is mare's tail control in the absence of an auxin. How many days in front of the planter? Yeah, okay. So 
you know, for mare's tail control, we think of products that work really well as far as that burn down scenario. Uh, we're wanting to use, you know, the growth regulators work really well. Um, Sharpens another another good product, a, a PPO side of things there uh, that have very effective control on on mare's tail in that burn down scenario. So it's kind of a catch twenty two because we're of course the earlier we can get that burn down put on with mare's tail, we want to control that plant when it's a rosette. Um, once we start to get to this time of the year, we're starting to get warmer. Those rosette plants are going to bolt. So as those plants start to bolt products such as sharpen as that plant gets bigger, it's going to be harder for it to control a bigger plant versus a smaller plant. So as soon as we can get on and get that burn out, especially if we're talking about mare sale, the better off um, we're going to we're going to be. As far as any type of residual value, um, we kind of want to make sure that we're putting that down around when the planter is rolling. So if we think about these residual products, they're going to break down 28 days after treatment. So the closer we can get to the planter with that, that's going to get us further into the season with that. But like Luke said, any product, we got to be looking at our plant back restrictions when we're talking about burn downs. But the closer we can get, uh, sometimes, you know, we always want to make a, a one-pass system, make it a little bit easier. Uh, but as far as weed control, the closer we can get that residual to that planter following plant back restrictions, the better off we will be for our residual control. We're putting that residual out when we truly need it. Uh, Luke, anything yeah. to add there? Go, oh, Austin. Go ahead, Austin. Uh, well, I was just going to touch on it real quick. Uh, I do a lot of Roundup 2,4-D leadoff uh, in, in front of corn. Uh, I like it. You can clean up the broadleafs and leadoffs are great, uh, especially really good on, on grass residual. Uh, so just to speak to that, that question, 7 to 14-day plant back is what you're looking at there. Um, depending on the rate of 2,4-D you're using. Uh, mare's tail control in the absence of auxin, sharpen. So sharpen's my, my go-to there. So whether that's a verdict or sharpen uh, product, one of the, the two, uh, or you could use Gramoxone plus atrazine. Going to be a little bit weaker there. Um, so I would, I'd really rather use an auxin. Secondly, uh, second place would be sharpen. Third place would be Gramoxone plus um, atrazine. Uh, then, yeah, 7 to 14 days ahead of the planter uh, is what you want to be. Luke, anything to add? Yeah, only thing I was going to add, Austin, he, he handled that well as far as uh, kind of breaking that out in there in what would be a, you know, the best, second best, secondary. Um, keep in mind, sharpen rates, uh, you can go much higher. Corn has a lot higher uh, tolerance to sharpen rates. Um, so if you go higher rates, you don't have to worry about the plant back as much. Being yet, be especially mindful. Corn's much more tolerant to it. So uh, I actually have a question that I actually, this, I'm so happy I can actually answer a question here. <laughs> it's uh, with the Extendiflex and will the Extendiflex and Elite 27 label be delayed with coronavirus? Um, well, actually, I said I could answer it. I'll address it. How's that? Uh, here's what I would tell you. We, I would say that um, it is slowing things down. Will the label be delayed? Not sure yet. Um, but it, it, everything is being, I would say, slowed down because of, of the coronavirus issue. Uh, so nothing is definitive as far as when those labels will be uh, uh, finalized and released. But I would tell you, it, it does seem like there's, uh, as with everything in the government right now, it's slowing things down. But I, I've, we've had calls with uh, BASF um, and, and Bayer both, and it's just, we're still waiting. So, so I answered without an answer. <laughs> uh, let's see. Austin, we'll start with you on this one. For water hemp control, we're using Group 15 herbicides 45 days after planting. Has water hemp reached a degree of res resistance yet that we should expect any problems? Uh, so to answer that question, I'd have to ask where you are. <clears throat> so this group person is in, they're in, uh, I'll call it Northwest Ohio. Okay. I don't think Ohio has that group 15, uh, that group 15 resistance confirmed yet. Uh, I will say the University of uh, Illinois, uh, or the state of Illinois and the state of Arkansas 
both have confirmed group 15 resistance. Uh, so that's something that, um, that does need to be thought about. Uh, I'm not going to discourage the use of group 15 because that's really our in-season residual that we can rely on. Uh, but what I will say is uh, if you can stack heavy on the pre and then layer your residual in, then you're going to set yourself up for the best results. So uh, just to summarize, yes, that is something to be concerned about. We are starting to see some resistance build to group 15s. Uh, as far as I know, Luke can back me up here. Uh, as far as I know, there's been no confirmed resistance in the state of Ohio to group 15 herbicides, though. Luke? Yeah, that, that, that is accurate, uh, Austin. There isn't any. Uh, there are some suspected pockets of tolerances. Back to Austin's point, having multiple sites of action in your pre becomes even more critical. And like Joe's data would suggest, two at least, probably three, and I like products that have uh, you know, varying solubilities. Uh, you know, say a metribuzum with sulfentrazone um, that are going to perform you know, as best as we can expect in both a wet or a dry year to reduce the pressure on that group 15 in season. So, Luke, how do I know how do I know solubility? Where do I find that information at? <laughs> that uh, that's that million dollar question, I guess, or answer. <laughs> but um, so uh, there's ways of finding that as far as uh, university data and, and uh, solubility charts and KOC values as far as their soil persistency. Um, generally speaking, um, and these other guys can probably answer it better than me, but uh, I tend to lean towards having two to three sites of action, and a lot of times when you have, for instance, a ALS PPO with a metribuzin, you tend to have varying solubilities. But to truly get to that information, you know, you have to look it up through, uh, through some of the university data. I've got some cheat sheets I use to know those things and so forth. But to just kind of spread out your risk in terms of a wet or dry season that tends to uh, uh, be more forgiving. Uh, Joe, so we, we talked about group 15 resistance in Illinois, and, and Austin talked about stacking sites of action. I have two, two questions for you. One is, um, can you address the, uh, the group 15 issue in Illinois? And then also, um, we, we talk about sites of action, and, and I also hear the, the phrase effective sites of action. What's, what's the difference? So two questions uh, for you. So as far as resistance uh, in Illinois, yeah, there, there's a couple different pockets uh, that, you know, back in last, last year that was all re reported. Um, you know, to me, that's probably one of the more scary resistance. Of course, any resistant weed's scary, but as far as groups um, that we've had in a while, because we rely a lot on group 15s today, and we talk about rotating sites of action, but as far as water hemp management, we're almost kind of put into a box where we have to rely heavily on them um, because probably the majority of the callers on this call at some point, whether we're talking their corn or soybean program, there's going to most likely be a group 15 at some point in those programs. So we use them in both. Um, you know, it's just like what they said, making sure that we're not just relying on the group 15s, that we're trying to get those other sites of action in there to make sure that these 15s remain effective uh, for, for years to come because they are an important part. And that kind of plays into the second part of the question uh, with effective sites of action. So if we look at the your herbicide labels, they'll have the groups on there. So we talk a lot about the different herbicide groups. Um, so not all groups, we may have effective control with certain populations of water hemp. So if we take a look at my favorite example to give is the group twos, the ALSs. Well, uh, a lot of us that farmed in the early 90s before the Roundup Ready crops kind of remember using pursuits, those group twos. So a lot of the pigweed populations have developed resistance um, to group two herbicides. So if I go and I, I, we got data that shows using at least two sites of action, we really increase our control over one, and I pick a product that let's say is a group two and a, and a group 14 product, I, I think I'm doing a good job because I'm listening. I'm doing two sites of action. But really, we're just relying on that PPO, that group 14, because we can't give credit to um, the, the group two. So even though we're selecting a product that has two sites of action, there's probably 
only one effective site of action with that product. So um, that's just kind of what we say with the effective. You know, we're, we're kind of making some judgment calls on that and kind of some assumptions that for group twos. But um, that's one of the groups that if you have water hemp, that there's probably a good chance that your population's got some resistance to it. Um, so we want to maybe be looking at the group fives, the group 14s, the group 15s, um, that's going to kind of help us out in our soybean programs where we know now we're getting more likely three effective sites of action for our water hemp hey, control. Hey, Jim, could Go I ahead. add something real yep. quick? Of course. Um, as weed scientists, we are always trying to prevent the inevitable. Uh, resistance is something, I mean, it, we can push it down the road and maybe uh, slow it down a little bit. Um, but, I mean, it is something we're going to deal with eventually. So uh, as weed scientists, we, we can scare you sometimes. So let me, let me throw some positivity on this. Um, we do have some new sites of action, uh, novel sites of action in the pipeline moving forward in the future. FMC has a brand new mode of action coming out in a few years. Hopefully we'll have that uh, here in the next three to five years. Uh, that is completely novel, that has good activity on small seeded broadleaves like water hemp and palmer amaranth. Uh, Bayer has some new, uh, some new chemicals coming out in the, in the future uh, that will have activity on these weeds as well. So I know it's been 35, 40 years since we've had any novel chemistries come out. Uh, so let me just add that bit of positivity in. Um, we, we, do ha we are going to have other options in the future. Uh, but until we get there, uh, you know, we're, we're working with what we've got, so we need to be, be careful uh, and not lose these until we get the new chemistries at least. Okay. I've got a couple questions here in the, in the queue. And, by the way, I, I promise I will get to all of them. So there's been a question in the queue here from Minnesota. I will get to that one in just a second. Um, but while we're on resistance, this question just came in. Has there been any herbicide resistance found with 2,4-D or dicamba? Uh, Austin, you were... Uh, talking, so why don't you start? Any written resistance with 2,4-D or dicamba? Uh, yes, yes, there is. Uh, so we've we've had uh, oxen resistant kochia, dicamba resistant uh, kochia for for a while now before the the technologies were launched. Uh, I think Kansas confirmed 2,4-D resistant water hemp last year. Uh, nothing really in, in the majority of our marketing area. We haven't confirmed resistance yet. Uh, the University of Arkansas and the University of Tennessee uh, have some populations that that are showing the early signs of resistance. We can't really say the R word on it just yet. So not resistance, but tolerance, I guess, would be a better way to put it for right now. Um, as far as Palmer, Palmer Amaranth goes there. Uh, so there are cases of resistance that are uh, that are out there, uh, but for right now, across the majority of our marketing area, it still is an effective. Both of those uh, options are still effective control options. Luke, I I assume though that since <laughs> since we just come out with these threes and we just come out with extend and extend flex. Um, and yet now we hear that there's 2,4-D and dicamba-resistant populations. Um, what do I do then? Should, are you, should we not necessarily just do those products in post? Are you making, what other suggestions would you make uh, to, as Austin talks about, uh, prevent the inevitable? Yeah, so we've talked a lot about sites of action. You know, I go back to the fact that when we're pre-emerged, we have so many more options, right? We have so many more uh, I'll even say effective sites of action pre-emerge to try to, like Austin said, delay delay the inevitable. One thing that hasn't been probably highly adopted, because I know a lot of growers, they get into uh, uh, ways of doing things, they get a comfort level with it a certain platform, but we can help ourselves and to delay what Austin referred to as the inevitable if we're willing to, to uh, change those herbicide tolerances. For instance, if in 2020 you're raising extend soybeans, uh, can you look at possibly or could a, could a grower consider using, uh, if they're going to beans in 2022, possibly going to uh, the ability to post apply with Liberty? Anything we can do to break up that cycle of total reliance on a single site uh, will help us to, to delay that inevitable along with just making sure those effective sites of action like Joe referred to pre 
is, is really a, the, the balancing act. But changing up those herbicide tolerances is, is going to be a necessary uh, evil um, or a necessary uh, risk management tool. Uh, Joe, anything to add? Yeah, so exactly what Luke was talking about. You know, I, I say weed management to me, it's kind of like when I'm designing a, a program, is it's kind of like a game. We sit there and look at those sites of action, and, and I'm trying to think of ways. How can we get more of those numbers into our program? So if you're kind of just keeping that in mind, uh, maybe if you're using, a, you know, an active in the burn down, you know, only use that active maybe once if you can, and then try to look at something else in your, in your post trip. So uh, especially with these products that have post activity, just trying to switch it up. Austin earlier mentioned germoxone. Uh, so the burn down is a perfect opportunity and maybe use other sites of action such as germoxone that we can't use all season long in season to then save some of those products that are effective such as uh, Ingenia, uh, Enlist, Liberty, saving those for, you know, when we get in season um, and maybe looking at using Gramox on a way to get a group 22 and just only having that active try to show up once. Sometimes Mother Nature will throw us the curveball and maybe we have to um, use a group twice, but, uh, you know, just try to find ways to switch that up. All right, I've got a question here from Minnesota. I'm going to read it. Uh, before I do, uh, if, if you would like to ask a question, um, if you see the, the that bar, the third bubble from the right looks kind of like a, a chat balloon. That's where you can add your questions. So feel free to add questions anytime. Here's guys. I'm going to read this question. I'm going to read it through twice, and then um, somebody wants to attack it, they can. Uh, here's what it says: so We are in Minnesota doing. We are in Minnesota doing no-till, uh, non-GMO corn. Um, we're, we are in Minnesota doing no-till corn, non-GMO. We interseed corn at V4 with both grass and broadleaf species. What is the best option for a pre? Round up and burn it? Can, can you guys hear me? I'm getting some feedback there, Jim. If, if yep, you could repeat so the question, I. I'd appreciate it. Yeah, me too. Yep. I, I got the same feedback. That's why I paused. Uh, we're in Minnesota doing no-till, non-GMO. We interseed corn at V4 with both grass and broadleaf species. What's the best option for a pre? Roundup and verdict? Uh, so I'll, I'll start this. Um, and I may need a, a few more points of clarification along the way. So it's it's no-till, non-GMO corn that's interseeded at V4 with grass and broadleaf species. Is is that right, Jim? Yeah. Let me let me read again. It says we're in Minnesota doing no-till, non-GMO. We interseed corn at V4 with both grass and broadleaf species. What is the best mm -hmm. option for a pre roundup and verdict? Uh, so excellent question. Um, the, I guess my next follow-up question before I could fully answer this is what kind of grass and broadleaf species are you interceding with? Uh, because some of these residual herbicides have carryover onto certain cover crop species, so to speak. Um, the University of Missouri, Joe's alma mater, uh, Kevin Bradley there has got an excellent um, herbicide chart, herbicide uh, carryover chart. It's, uh, I forget the name of it, uh, herbicide influence on cover crop species. Uh, and so I would, I would highly recommend that, that this user reference that, uh, that chart before picking their herbicides because they have to know what cover crop or what they're going to intercede with, uh, the grass and broadleaf species, so that they can pick a herbicide that wouldn't interfere with that establishment. Anybody else? Uh, Luke? Well, the one thing I was going to add, Jim, back to Austin's point as well, to refer back to that, because within that chart, I think there is also, uh, uh, you know, basically some, some helpful, uh, I guess, information around, you know, what would provide the longest residual, and in, in, for instance, uh, an Armazon Pro, so a premix of Armazon um, and so forth, um, would provide the shortest, but it does really tend to go back to those species, specific species that are uh, both that grass and broadleaf, I think you mentioned. Joe, anything to add there? 
Yeah, so like Austin was saying, so if you go to uh, weedscience.missouri.edu, Dr. Bradley's done a lot of work on this and uh, has a lot of different publications. And you, there's actually a table there that you can look at uh, some of these different products, like Austin said, um, these residual products we got to keep in mind with these different cover crops. Um, how, or how are we going to have any injury with them? Um, so it's a great resource. You get on their website there. You can pull up that chart. Um, that will kind of help you uh, pick out which ones to definitely avoid and then kind of go from, go from there. All right. Good. Perfect. Um, here's one. Um, let's see. Austin, let's start with you. Can applying lime impact my herbicide efficacy? Can applying lime impact my herbicide efficacy? Uh, yeah, Jim, I, I would say so most definitely. There's several herbicides out there that are pH influenced. Uh, so when we think of lime applications, uh, typically we're, we're doing that to raise the pH, uh, get it closer to that neutral zone. Uh, if, if that pH drops too low and gets too acidic, uh, you can actually get into some issues with, with herbicide efficacy. So yes, I would say applying lime. Uh, if you want your, your crops to, to take up nutrients better, uh, uh, a list of things, but uh, specifically speaking to, to herbicides, applying lime and maintaining a good pH in that 6.2 to 6.5, 6.6 range is going to give you better herbicide efficacy. Luke or um, Joe, anything to add there? Uh no, I think I think he covered it there. Okay, uh, Joe, I got Liberty Plus Clefidem versus Liberty Plus Glyphosate. Yeah, uh, so a lot of that last year we started to do a little bit of work on the Liberty Plus Glyphosate combination, and uh, we we've seen it be very effective across grasses and broadleaves. It's kind of uh, maybe taking maybe those little bit earlier applications of Liberty and a little bit later applications kind of help boost a little bit of the efficacy on Liberty, even on some of the water hemp populations increasing by a few percent. However, um, we're still going to want to do afternoon applications. Heat of the day when it's hot and humid with, with Liberty, that's when we've seen it best. So a lot of it comes down then to what type of weed are we controlling? So. One advantage of Liberty and glyphosate would be not only like clefidem we have grass control, but clefidem we wouldn't have the broadleaf control. So maybe uh, if we think of some of the weeds that glyphosate still has good control on or some of the weeds that Liberty may be weaker in, grass, maybe um, some velvet leaf, some cocklebur, but glyphosate still works really well with those. So with that in mind, uh, that's look at your weed spectrum. So if volunteer corn's an issue and that was a GMO um, hybrid the year before, of course the Roundup's not going to do anything, the glyphosate's not going to do anything. So that's where that clutchedem advantage comes in um, versus using a glyphosate with Liberty. Um, but if you have some other broadleaves out there that you think Liberty may be a little bit weaker on, uh, but glyphosate still works well, such as velvet leaf, that's when we get that advantage. Now, sometimes with some of these different mixtures, we can get antagonism. Um, so the key with Liberty and glyphosate is, the key with Liberty and glyphosate is to control the weeds when they're small. Uh, if we have those weeds less than four inch tall weeds, um, we don't really see that antagonism. However, if that grass becomes larger, um, that's when we can start to see that antagonism with that Liberty and glyphosate. So spraying the weeds when they're small, especially grasses, is key if we're going to do that combination. Uh, Austin, Liberty Plus Clefidem versus Liberty Plus glyphosate. Thoughts? Comments? Uh, yeah. I've, um, me personally, uh, I like Liberty. I like the glue glue combination. Um, I, I tend to see much better broadleaf kill uh, when you tank mix glue gly uh, or, or Liberty and, and glyphosate together. Um, whereas uh, back when we were looking at, at uh, the Liberty Link soybeans, uh, you know, clefidum was our only option to control grasses. And, and I would miss a lot of grasses sometimes, especially if they were bigger, harder to control grasses or we're in a drought stress situation. Um, so. Uh, Jim, personal preference, I tend to lean, lean more towards the, the glue gly combination than the, the glufosinate and clefidum combination. Just personal, Luke, personal preference there. Yep. 
Luke, any thoughts from your perspective? Uh, I, I've used it more. The combination wood I have used more in corn, and I would concur with uh, with Austin in AM corn. Uh, the one thing I would add, I think Joe covered majority, is to just ensure that uh, you know that you're couple things that you're using you know the appropriate uh, best management practices for whatever's doing the majority of the work. For instance, if you were dependent on Liberty doing the vast majority of the work. You making sure we have more gallons. I think Joe mentioned maybe it heat of the day. Um, you know, and make sure we're using the appropriate nozzle selection. Uh, if Liberty is doing the majority work, and please don't ignore you know AMS and AMS rates to to make sure we get the best efficacy. But no, I think they covered it very well. Well, hey, while we're on AMS, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Was that Austin? Hey, Jim, I'll I'll oh, go ahead. I I agree with Austin on that. It is. Uh, it is amazing how much more broader spectrum weed control you have with that glyphosate just because that glyphosate overclucked them. It's going to be a more broader spectrum um, weed control herbicide versus cleft of them. So uh, we really liked it, liked it here and had a lot of good luck with it. So um, this question is, we were talking glue glide, this question popped in. It says, some chemical suppliers have said you can really screw up the soybean plant physiologically when tank mixing a glyphosate and glufosinate. Seen anything there? Joe, we'll start with you. Um, so when we did it this year, or last year, 2019, when we did some testing with it, um, we didn't really re see a response. We tried a, a couple different surfactants with the glue glide tank mix. Um, we didn't really see quite the response. Um, we do, it, it's, I would say, probably seen a little bit more response when we use the Enlist 1 and Liberty put together versus what we've seen Liberty and Glyphosate put together. Even the Enlist and Liberty put together, um, it's still it's still very little crop, re uh, crop response. It's just maybe a little bit more chlorotic than what maybe growers have been used to back to the Roundup crops and the Liberty link crops. But as far as Liberty and Glyphosate put together, um, we didn't really see anything. However, when those applications were made, um, we were pretty cool. And we know when we get hot, humid weather, that's going to heat that AMS up. Uh, so maybe growers a little bit further south, maybe down in Austin's area, he may see a little bit more crop response out of it than what we've seen last year since we're a lot cooler and less humidity. Well, how about it, Austin? You're in the, you're in the warm south. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you screwed up soybeans with blue light tank mixes? Uh, so, no. The short answer to that is no, I've not. Uh, I've, I've put it on a lot of acres. Um, maybe what they're referring to uh, is the fact that Liberty does have a tendency to make a soybean stay green sometimes. Uh, you know, it's an, an ammonium assimilation um, site of action, uh, so you can get a lot of ammonium buildup in that plant uh, sometimes. But it, the the short of it, Jim, I have not seen it screw up the physiology of the plant. I've seen it work extremely well uh, when applied correctly and and at the right times. Remember, Liberty's got an R1 cutoff, so you can't you can't spray it. Uh, it as soon as you see the blooms pop up on that plant, you got to shut down that Liberty application. Uh, so as long as they're following the the most restrictive herbicide label of whatever's in the tank mix there then I have not seen it screw up the the physiology of that soybean plant. Luke, let's just go around the table on this one. Glue glide tank mix is problem. Uh, Austin, you, 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 you already said what I was going to say. The one I've seen challenged is that typically when was when folks were pushing herbicide labels and, and because of weather maybe they couldn't get in timely and they were in that R1, R2. Uh, I know that doesn't happen, but it might have happened in Ohio. Um, with, with some Liberty applications, and I have seen a little bit of stay green. I call it stay green, uh, where we get uh, those green stems, mature beans, uh, back to some of that is, you know, metabolizing that herbicide, that ammonium basis, and some of it, quite frankly, the crop had to do with the crop under stress. And the added stress and then trying to metabolize that herbicide uh, ended up leading to just a little bit of uh, uh, flower and young pot abortion uh, when it was a little past label. And ultimately, then the beans tended to to harbor all those photosynthates in the stem and make for a challenge to mature as as naturally as we'd like to see. Uh, Luke, I'm going to stay with you real quick um, as we as I ask this question because we were we were touching on uh, AMS and I've got another uh, question popped in the queue. 
So liquid AMS is a lot more convenient. Why would I consider dry, especially with Liberty? Yeah, so Jim, I get this question a lot, and it's probably one of the more misunderstood portions about herbicides. And as we get more and more tank mixes, and, and Liberty is a, a bigger part of a lot of uh, herbicide programs, uh, we have to be mindful of how that both ammonium and sulfate portion, or I would encourage you to be mindful of both how the ammonium and sulfate portion are essential to getting weak acid herbicides in our plants. Generally speaking, a lot of our uh, spray water is, is uh, derived from a well. There's some folks that are using, you know, pond water and, and rooftop water from downspouts. I get that. But primarily a lot of it's well water. And in a lot of the area that I cover, uh, in fact, all of it pretty much, we have hard water, meaning it's got lots of calcium, magnesium, some iron as well. And those elements make it a challenge to get our weak acid herbicide actually in the plant. And so when we use or when folks want to use liquid AMS is because of um, convenience, it's very difficult. In fact, I would argue even quite, is it even possible to get the same volume of a, both ammonium and sulfate in that spray solution because the sulfate is what basically uh, binds up all your hard water elements to keep them from interfering with herbicide efficacy and herbicide uptake, uh, or intake, I should say. And then the ammonium attaches to, say, Liberty or, or, or glyphosate or that weak acid and drags it in the plant. Many times with liquids, you get just a fraction of actually the ammonium and the sulfate to truly, uh, I'll say, uh, neutralize, so to speak, or neutralize those hard water elements and then have enough ammonium to drag it in the plant. And typically, I see more consistent for certain performance with dry AMSs. I know they're not the most convenient, but in terms of efficacy and performance, uh, we just get a lot more ammonium and sulfate to make those products, especially like a Liberty, perform at, uh, at peak. Joe, do you have any uh, additional comments in that regard? No, I think, uh, I think you covered it well. And the, like, going back to the most restrictive label, I think this is kind of a, a good a good point to bring this up is, you know, we got to keep in mind, like they said, we want to make sure that for the AMS requirements, whether we're talking Enlist or Liberty or Liberty and Glyphosate, all those put together, um, we're making that Liberty do that heavy, heavy work. And the main thing is that we're putting that two to three pounds with those different mixtures uh, per acre, like Luke is talking about there. Um, that's that's the, the main concept of, of, of why. So we want to make sure that, um, we're doing that. As far as the uh, most restrictive label part of it is, you know, if we think of uh, spray tips and things along the, of the lines, if we're talking about Enlist and Liberty put together, um, the, at that point, then Enlist is going to be the most restrictive. So we got to make sure that if we think of Liberty, we need that coverage. So we need smaller droplets. However, since Enlist has more of the restriction on the nozzle type, um, we're going to have to make sure when we're looking at that Enlist one label that we're selecting the most restrictive part of it. But as far as Enlist one and Liberty or Glue I put together, having that approved AMS formulation in there um, to help that Liberty out. So, Joe, stay with us here because I know you've uh, done some work. Somebody um, typed this in, and I just want to address this one and then maybe a little more broadly. So Clefidem cannot be as, can be not as effective if mixed with group 15 chemistry. So clethodim antagonism with group 15s or even other herbicides. Um, thoughts, comments? Um, so if, if, if we look at our herbicide brochure, um, we kind of address that a little bit. So uh, with more, that's kind of one of the recommendations um, with more and, and clethodim that we want to increase our clethodim rate um, versus if we don't have that more in there. Uh, I think they're starting to get a little more talk with the enlist ops than Luke if you guys want to jump in there, but listen to their calls and stuff. Uh, there's kind of maybe a little bit there with the clethodim, but the big one that sticks out in my mind as far as the group 15s is if we got the warrant with that clethodim is we're going to want to bump our clethodim rate up to kind of help out because we do see maybe a little bit of antagonism with that group 15 there. Austin? 
Yeah, so those ACC8 inhibitors like clethodum, cethoxidum, um, and even the FOPs, the DEMs and the FOPs are, are what we think about with the grass killers. Uh, they tend to be some of the most antagonistic uh, herbicides we have to deal with. You spray them by themselves, they work good. It's when you put them in combination with, with other herbicides where they tend to antagonize some. So, yeah, group 15s with clethodum, I'm always up in the rate of clethodum. Uh, auxins with clethodum. Uh, so like Dicamba 2,4-D and, and other auxin herbicides, auxins tend to antagonize um, ACC8 inhibitors also. Uh, so if, if I'm mixing mixing it with, with Dicamba or 2,4-D, I'm more than likely going to up the rate just a little bit. I I tend to see see the antagonism with, with clustrum quite a bit. So uh, I, I'm, I'm on the higher use rate there. Jim, if I can add in one more thing. Yep. Yeah, I just want yep. to add a couple of little things. They're they're minor, but they're things we probably uh, uh, would we would serve as well to pay a little more attention to than in the past. Is is uh, first of all mixing order. Generally, we speak about whales and dales, so basically dries in order of of adding them to the tank, dries, um, and then down to your solubles or your liquids. With clethodim, it's one of the most antagonistic products. And Austin's point: those group ones are. If you can, add them to the tank last. Uh, so put in your, your tank mix products, your dry AMS first, and then and so on and so forth, dries to liquids. Put it in last, and, and if you can, head to the field as quick as possible. Um, the second part of this, that is try your best not to leave tank mixes, uh, you know, say sit overnight. Uh, just kind of a rule of thumb we've always had, but it becomes more um, important as we use these tank mix, uh, these wilder tank mix combinations that we're, we're having to use uh, to battle resistance. Okay. Last, um, last thing here, Jim, uh, yep. on that, uh, clethodum, uh, oil makes clethodum work. We have a tendency to reduce our oil, uh, especially post-merge, if we we're tank mixing it with another uh, oil-based product. I'm, I'm here to tell you though, that 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 so if you read the clethodim label, it typically uh, calls for one percent COC or crop oil concentration. Um, if you can maintain that one percent, it's going to make that clethodim work better. Excellent. So um, I'm going to switch gears. And by the way, just a reminder: you're free to pop in questions in the in the chat box. You can do it privately if you want. You just pull up my name and type it in. Some of you have been popping in questions privately. That's perfectly fine. Um, but hit that little uh, bubble that looks like a speech bubble, a talk bubble, and that will uh, allow you to type in questions. So let's talk tillage. Um, I've got a couple questions here. Uh, Austin, I'm going to start with you, and then I'm going to come to you, Luke. Um, do I lose residual if I run a tillage tool after spraying my herbicide? And what about, like, row cleaners? Uh, so the the short answer to this, uh, yes, I, I think you do lose some of your residual component. Um, however, if you look and and read uh, the, let's just use that's metalloquor dual uh, dual two magnum. If you read the dual two magnum label, um, which I highly suggest everybody do. It's just a short sixty four page label. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it says on there. Uh, if if you don't get an act, activating rainfall within 10 days and you start to see some weeds emerge, you need to use some sort of tillage tool to, to run over that, that ground to eliminate those weeds that have emerged. Because you got to remember, uh, a lot of our residual herbicides, especially our group 15s, have no reach back power. Uh, and what I mean by reach back is if the weed is already germinated and up, it's not going to be able to kill it once it gets activated. Uh, it can only prevent germination, not necessarily go back and, and kill later. Uh, there are some herbicides, uh, like balance uh, or atrazine, metribuzin, things like that, that do have some sort of some reach back power. Um, so uh, a lot of words there, Jim. Uh, short answer, yes, I think it does reduce your, your efficacy a lot of times with, with tillage, uh, but sometimes it's necessary to do so because there's no reach back power. Luke, let me, let me go to you. I'm going to ask you a slightly different question. Uh, so how long do I need to wait before and after vertical tillage to apply my burn down? So I get this question a lot as well. One, one phrase I use quite frequently is, is the hardest weed to kill is is that injured or sick weed. 
you know, and, and when we ding it up with tillage or herbicide, sometimes it's hard to really finish it off if we don't let one or the other run its course. So uh, I typically ask guys to, if, if they can, to get their tillage complete first, but that's usually not always the case because typically you can get on the field with a sprayer before you can uh, a tillage tool. But if we're applying herbicide and then going to do tillage, vertical tillage, shallow tillage afterwards, try to wait three days uh, minimum on annuals, five days on, on, on perennials. Um, so that three to five days allows that plant to take it in as long as you got good growing conditions or decent growing conditions to take it in and uh, move it throughout that plant, especially those systemic products, so that we can uh, not come in and wound it with the herbicide. And then vice versa, if you're going to do tillage, which is my preferred method, light tillage, and then come in and put herbicide on afterwards, at least minimum of three days for annuals, five days in the spring for perennials to get the best efficacy. Joe, any, any additional comments regarding tillage? Yeah, so actually we're uh, doing something exciting this year in PFR. Um, this is kind of a question that we've wondered ourselves is basically looking at incorporation versus some of the timing. So going out, spraying your pre-21 days before planting, and then uh, right before planting, incorporate it. Some labels say we can lightly incorporate, so taking a, a product that we can lightly incorporate, and then coming in um, after planting and then putting the pre. So hopefully here in a, if we, a few months we'll have some data that will maybe kind of help us a little bit just to kind of see because we kind of wonder that ourselves. I agree with Austin. You know, I, when I rate weed trials or residual trials, usually the first place um, that I'll see those products break is where either a row cleaner or a tractor tire, any type of soil disturbance that we've had is typically where I will start to maybe see a little bit of weed pressure first. So in my mind, I, I don't really like the soil disturbance. However, you know, sometimes if we look at the timing, uh, we got to go when we can go. So maybe we are putting um, that pre on before before the planter um, type type deal. So it just kind of depends. That's our preference. We're going to have some PFR data to kind of see which one's uh, better, <laughs> hopefully this year. And as, as far as, as Luke's question he got there, I, I agree with him. Is, you know, some of these products, and we got to remember if we're out there early and it's cool that amount of time that we need to give that product maybe a little bit longer. Um, if we're warm like that, you said, you know, those different timelines, those sound great. And we want to make sure we're getting that herbicide time to work. And that kind of deals with the herbicide, too. If we think of something like germoxone, or, or it's going to be really quick. Um, Sharpen is going to be quick as well versus those growth regulators. Uh, those are going to take a little bit longer. Growth regulators, glyphosate, that's going to take longer versus a product like germoxone or, or Sharpen to actually do its job. All right, so uh, Austin, this question is directed towards you. It says, Austin, so if we add clepidem to our post-emerge application of Liberty with dual 2 Magnum and AMS, are you recommending crop oil with that tank mix, or will that be too hot? <laughs> uh, yeah, so if you're in my neck of the woods, uh, I would say watch out, because you'll scald the leaves st straight off the, the plant. Uh, so... <laughs> If you're in the, the upper Midwest where it might be a little bit cooler, might not be as quite as humid, uh, you could reduce your your crop oil concentrate with all uh, with the AMS, with the dual, with the Liberty in there. That will be a really hot tank mix. So I would not recommend in that situation. Uh, I would not recommend putting the full one percent. But this is where you could put like a, a zero point two five percent, so a quart per hundred gallon of crop oil if you're in a, a climate that's not quite as hot and quite as humid. However, down in my area, uh, in in the south, uh, I'm more than likely not going to run crop oil concentrate with that tank mix. Luke, um, how about from your perspective, if we had clefidem to our post-emerge app of Liberty and Dual 2 Magnum and AMS, uh, crop oil, yes or no, or thoughts? Whenever we put a group 15 in there, um, to Austin's point, it just really heats it up. Um, and to me, a lot of that also goes back to size of grass and coverage. If you feel comfortable that you're going to get coverage and it's small grasses, you know, two and three, three inch weeds, I would lots rather prefer um, in that tank mix specifically uh, a grower increase his rate of clethodem 
uh, rather than ag crop oil, especially when you get into to, uh, higher temperatures, you know, 85 plus, because um, you are going to see significantly more crop response. But first thing I go back to is have coverage, so gallons, and make sure you're using the appropriate rate. Um, and, and if at all possible, leave the crop oil out when you add that group 15, like dual. Um, what rate on the Clefidem, Luke? And I know that doesn't, there's not a one-size-fits-all, but when you say up it, do you have a range in mind? Yeah, so I think we addressed it in the herbicide brochure. We have a 4 to 8. We're going to increase that slightly, like, to, to a 6 to 8. Um, but we'll, I would even go up another, you know, instead of 68, you know, go 10 to 12. So go up 40, 50 percent um, on, on, on smaller grasses, not as important, but typically um, by the time we do that post-merge application, they can have some size depending on the significance around our, or excuse me, the effectiveness of our residual path. So I typically that's would a two, just two pound add, product, right? Like, I'm sorry, good point, Austin. So that's a 2E, that's a two pound clethodem, specifically, Jim. Uh, there are uh, single pound products out there, two pounds the most common. There are even some three pounders now out there. So, but specifically to Austin's point, to a two pound gallon, increase your rate by uh, 40, 50 percent. Um, I think you'll be more effective than, than seeing the crop response when you have heat. Does that change if you're using a clefidem mainly for volunteer corn? Jim, can you repeat that? I'm sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Yeah, I'm sorry. So the 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 the, the, folk, the person asked that question said, oh, uh, thanks, Austin Luke, using clefidem mainly for volunteer corn. Does that so change anything rate-wise or anything? From my experience, um, I guess it depends if, you know, if, if it's volunteer, I'm assuming it's glyphosate and liberty tolerant. Um, it, I'm going to assume that for the, for the sake of the question. Um, typically, rate, it, from my perspective, primarily just speeds up the, the kill rate. Uh, the herbicide rate typically just speeds up the herbicide, okay. or excuse me, the, the lethality and the kill rate on volunteer okay. corn. I'm going to read this next question, and then uh, whoever wants it can, can take it. It says, thoughts or concerns on lowering water carrier pH for post-emerge glyphosate application in soybeans? Would muriatic acid be safe to use to do this? I'm going to read it again. Thoughts or concerns on lowering water carrier pH for post-emergence glyphosate application in soybeans? Would muriatic acid be safe to use to do this? So I, I don't. I'm gonna. I'll be the first to tackle it, but I'm sure there's gonna be other contributors. I hope. I don't have any experience with muriatic acid. Um, I go back to what is the water source, um, and and uh, typically when we use glyphosate, they typically perform by themselves better in a more acidic solution or lower pH. Um, I don't have experience with muriatic acid, um, but they do perform better in lower pH. That also becomes highly dependent on what is the water source. And if you're pulling, um, say, pond water or river water, or uh, there's a fair amount of folks now starting to use like reverse osmosis water, um, or or even more prevalent like rooftop water that doesn't have the hard water elements, it doesn't become as necessary. Um, I'll just add those points. Don't have any experience with it though per se. Any any addition there, Austin? Uh, I don't have any uh, any experience with that specific product. I think we've used some citric acid products before to lower the the pH, lower the the solution. You got to think glyphosate most of the time is going to run uh, right about a five on the the pH scale for uh, just by itself. So it is by itself uh, extremely acidic. So it's going to lower the the pH of the water. Um, the majority of the water in in my state is going to run somewhere in. I mean, it's a huge range. Uh, I'd say a five five to a seven. Uh, like I said, huge range there. Glyphosate's acidic by itself. Where I have lowered the pH, I have seen glyphosate work better. Uh, but that's that's a very very general answer. Uh, that I don't want anybody to to make any. Uh, changes based on, uh, but I have seen it. I have seen that work in situations where we have a, a slightly neutral water solution. 
Joe, any experience with uh, uh, muriatic acid or other comments about glyphosate and pH in uh, soybeans? No, I, I'm like the rest of the guys. I haven't had experience uh, with that one. But uh, as far as their comments and stuff, you know, I, I think, yeah, the pH range there and the fives and stuff, uh, I think, you know, that, that covered it pretty well. So, Joe, let me hey, thank you. Jim? Oh, yeah, go hey, ahead, Jim, Luke. Could I just yep. add one more comment? Sorry. Sure. Uh, I would encourage the, the, the questioner to also consider uh, just lowering the pH does not um, – per se, uh, deviate from the need for a sulfate, com you know, sulfate portion unless you're dealing with water that's, that has no, uh, does not you know, contain any of them hard water elements, calcium, magnesium, iron, et cetera. That sulfate portion is still uh, very important in that situation. So a lot would depend on your water source. Cool. Hey, I'll, I'll add too, uh, be very, very careful about lowering the pH if you're ever using a dicamba product in the tank. We do not want yep. a low pH with any dicamba. Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, so, Joe, I want to come back to you. Um, we've got some new technologies coming out. Uh, and I've got two questions around new technologies. I'll start with you, Joe, um, on this one. When should I use Enlist One Plus Liberty versus Enlist Duo? Okay, so yeah, if we look at the Enlist, Enlist One versus Enlist Duo, so Enlist Duos, the 2,4-D choline with the glyphosate mixed with it as a premix. Then list one, just the 2,4-D choline by itself. Um, we've been really familiar hacking, get on websites up with the whether we're talking to Genia or Extendamax, and looking to see what's an approved tank mix partner. Well, Enlist is no difference. We have to get on EnlistTankMix.com look and make sure that we're using an approved tank mix partner. So what you'll notice on their website is that Enlist ones got more tank mix flexibility. There's maybe a few more options on Enlist One. And one of the options being is, is Liberty. So if we're running Enlist One, um, Liberty is a tank mix option. So I really like that combination when we're talking tough to control weeds. So if we think about mare's tail, glyphosate resistant pig weeds, now we have two effective sites of action. You know, earlier we did a lot of conversation about having more effective sites of action. Well, that Enlist One and Liberty put together is in a very effective combination on those tough to control glyphosate resistant broadleaf weeds such as water hemp, mare's tail, giant ragweed. So if we're dealing with those glyphosate resistant weeds, um, that's gonna be my, my preference on the tank mixture to go with, um, just because we're getting two effective sites of action out there on those tough to control weeds. Uh, do you have any key tips for Enlist One and Liberty? Are there any key usage tips? So we're gonna we're gonna want to run a one to one ratio. So 32 ounces of Enlist One and 32 ounces of Liberty. So that's when we see our, our best combos that one to one ratio with it. Um, we still, you know, we're always gonna want to target weeds when they're small. It's gonna make it easier for these herbicides to work. Um, going back to the most restrictive label, you know, if we think about Liberty, we're thinking about small droplets. Um, as far as the enlist, we're going to be restricted on what nozzles we can run. So if we're putting Liberty with enlist one, we have to then look at the enlist one label and run the nozzle tips that they want. Um, there's some TTIs. Um, there's also some larger AIXRs with some bigger orifice sizes. So just making sure we're using an approved nozzle with that mixture. Luke, any additional comments there as it relates to um, Enlist One uh, plus Liberty versus Enlist Duo in your mind? Um, a couple things that uh, I don't have a ton of experience, a little bit of a experience with it, but is it's real simplified. Water and patience are your friend when you think about the tank mix. So like usual, I've already brought it up once, AMS in the tank first. Uh, given that time, it becomes uh, what we've learned is given that the necessary time to dissolve. Uh, so Joe Eichley out of North Coast State, he suggested two minutes, the AMS in the tank before you add anything else to dissolve dries, and, or I'm sorry, five minutes on dries and two minutes on liquids. Um, so water and patience, the more gallons tends to, to, to help that tank mixing. 
and patience between uh, mixing the products together. Uh, the one thing he also um, uh, warned of is, is not getting in a hurry putting products in the tank, specifically not putting, say, uh, like Liberty with Enlist One in the tank at the same time, you'll you'll get some sludge and some some crud build up. So water and patience. I tend to lean towards the Enlist One Liberty combination because you can fluctuate your glyphosate uh, rate if you choose. You can use the glyphosate of your choice, and then the tank mix flexibility is so much greater with Enlist One um, than say just Enlist Duo if you need to add something else. Austin, before I turn uh, this que that question over to you, I also want to, when you're done with that one, because uh, this question has come up, um, uh, any difference between the extended max and Ingenia? Does one work better than the other? Joe brought those two up. So start with the uh, the first question about um, Enlist One plus Liberty versus Enlist Duo, and then uh, go into extended max and Ingenia question. Uh, just listen to Joe and Luke as far as the first question goes. Uh, the nozzle restrictions that, that Joe keeps alluding to, you can find those nozzles on the, the tank mix websites. There's also a pressure range that goes in with them. Uh, obviously, Liberty likes smaller droplets, finer droplet size. So if you're if you're forced to use that that nozzle that has a large droplet, say an AIXR with a large orifice, uh, be at the top side of that pressure range. So stay on label. Uh, but know that you can run up to 60 or 70 pounds of pressure with those labels. That'll help decrease your your um, your droplet size with that higher pressure. Uh, but outside of that, those guys handled that question extremely well. Moving on to the next question, uh, differences in Extendamax and Ingenia. Uh, there is a difference there. So uh, Extendamax is the formulation on that is DGA, so diglycolamine. Um, formulation on on that dicamba product. Uh, it's got vapor grip in it. So uh, if you look back, um, Clarity is our, our older uh, dicamba formulation we use a lot of times in, in corn and burn down. Clarity is a DGA formulation also. Uh, Extendamax is a DGA formulation. Nothing different there. What, what Bayer and, and actually BSF helped develop that uh, is they added vapor the vapor grip portion into it to to recre decrease the volatility. Uh, BASF uh, developed Ingenia also. Ingenia is not a DGA formulation. It's a BAPMA formulation. B A P M A, um, which is just in simpler terms, uh, let's just illustrate it as a, a DGA formulation of dicamba is the size of a golf ball, and a BAPMA uh, formulation, the molecule, is the size of a uh, basketball. All right, so it's just a larger, heavier molecule. Uh, Efficacy-wise, I think they kill right about the same. There's not gonna, you're not going to see much of a difference on weed control, uh, but the, the BAPMA molecule is just a bigger, heavier molecule that was designed to fall quicker uh, because of its specific weight. Uh, so, yeah, again, very sciencey in the way I answered that, um, but the, the formulation difference is the, the key there, Jim. Um, we're, we're about uh, about done. I know we were, we've scheduled that we could go to three, but we're just about done with questions. Um, again, don't be afraid to type a question in the chat box. Happy to answer them. Um, Luke, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to you. Um, we've had... Uh, Wet spring last year, wet spring this year, struggling to get my pre done sometimes. Um, don't want to delay my planting. How, how can I control troublesome weeds, marriage tail, water hemp, um, without waiting to plant, right? Uh, what are my options? So, uh, without waiting to plant. So, I think we addressed a little of this in one of the earlier questions. So, because that is a, a, you know, unfortunately, a a popular concern in Ohio with our clay pan soils is don't want to have to wait on the 2,4-D label, et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of go back to a couple different combinations. Um, first of all, uh, if you have Extend Beans, uh, the Extendamax Genia that Austin just mentioned is a tremendous bird down tool. Um, I actually tend to think it's uh, more effective than 2,4-D as an active ingredient, that particular Austin. Uh, oxen herbicide, excuse me. Um, so that has, you know, as long as we're using an approved dicamba, we have no uh, 
um, playback restriction or no waiting period other than we want to give those products some time to get in the plant like uh, Joe and I addressed earlier there. Um, Liberty is typically not a good burn down product. I know that's what we want to maybe resort to at times, but typically when we have cooler temperatures, um, Liberty likes heat. It needs powerful sunlight. We don't typically have that in the spring. But universally across a lot of platforms, um, I tend to move towards those sharpened products first. Um, when it comes to say like Maristel burn down, your water hemp emergence typically isn't until uh, late spring through early fall. So it's, it's a much later emergence pattern than say giant ragweed or, or um, mare's tail. So I concentrate on mare's tail and giant ragweed first and that's why I like those sharpen products. Make sure you got MSO in the tank. That is a very, very necessary uh, adjuvant recommendation, not just recommendation, requirement for sharpen products. If you don't care to use that, um, because you do have a plant back restriction if you use sharpen with another group 14 of uh, minimum 14 days. Um, I like germoxone. My secondary go-to would be germoxone with metribuzin. You may have some escapes. Uh, hopefully the technology or platform you're using in, on, the, on the post side will have some forgiveness, whether it's Liberty or Enlist or uh, um, Extend Max and Genia with the Extend platform. Hey, Joe, uh, wet spring, um, what should I use for a burn down? What's your take? Yeah, well, I, I think Luke just nailed it there with, uh, with his answer. And the thing is, I think today it's a, it's a little bit easier maybe than what it was before we had Roundup Rate 2 extends and we had it in list now that we can use the approved growth regulators. That, that really helps out with the no plant back restriction. Uh, like he says, sharpen, you know, is a very effective burn down tool, but uh, if, we're, we're, if we're coming in with another PPO, we have to wait. Uh, Gramoxone, that metribuzin, uh, so that's an opportunity to use a group 22 and a group 5 in our soybean program, um, which are two products that we can't use in season. So that's very effective at rotating uh, our sites of action, getting another site of action out there that we won't use all season long. So I like that, me that mixture just because of having that group 22 and that group 5 out there, and we don't have that plant back restriction. Austin, how about your your take? Uh, that, those guys nailed it, Jim. All right, uh, we're going to ask one last question here, unless somebody else has one to the queue. So we'll go around the, around the horn, and then we'll we'll call it a webinar. Austin, uh, this question came in. I'm going to start with you. Can you actually can you really tank mix with systemic and a compact herbicide and have successful weed control? Yes. <laughs> Tell me more. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you absolutely can. Uh, so the 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 thought is that uh, a lot of times if you if you've got a contact in with a systemic, the contact will interfere uh, by burning the the leaf tissue enough before that systemic is able to to get in that plant and translocate. And that can be true with certain certain contact uh, herbicides in certain situations. Uh, again, really hot, lots of oil, uh, situations that are going to cause a lot of uh, immediate burn uh, on that that uh, foliar tissue. Those are is the instances that systemics probably won't work as well. Um, but it, I, I just go back to a, uh, a Liberty and a glyphosate tank mix. All right, so Liberty is mainly a contact killer. Glyphosate is mainly a systemic killer. Uh, and I've had extreme success at knocking some really big weeds down by tank mixing the two. Uh, so, I, I mean, that's, in, in my experience, so scientifically, yes, you can get some interference and some antagonism there. But in my experience, you can still do that and be extremely successful. Good. So uh, a couple things. Um, I've got another question that came in the queue, but don't forget Dr. Miller has posted down there, uh, we are awarding at WE, uh, the, you can earn a CEU for IPM for this webinar. So uh, the, the comments there are in the chat box if you wish to claim a, a CEU for IPM. So uh, I'll throw this question out and let the first guy handle this. Uh, how close to planting can I apply metribuzin before or after planting? Question. Um, How close to planting can I apply? Go ahead, Austin. So you, 
uh, I'll say you can apply mulch abusing cleanup until after you plant. Um, but uh, there's some watch outs there. Uh, one is, is soil pH, two is the rate of metribuzin you're using, um, and, and three would be soil texture. So uh, consult the label uh, because you can get in some issues with those three things um, if, you're not, if you're not careful. Uh, Joe, anything to add there? Yeah, and I'd say as far as rate, too, you know, rates going to kind of depend on what you know, of course, if metribuzin by itself, which is something that we're not going to recommend, we're going to need some other actives out there. You know, the rate can be higher, but if we have it, you know, spiking it with another pre-mix, um, we're going to definitely want to maybe kind of cut cut that rate back versus metribuzin alone, just because that's just more for the plant, the soybean plant, to have to metabolize. Luke. Uh, so I think everybody on this call that's speaking anyway knows I'm a fan of metrics and I like it as part of most every program. I think Austin nailed the rate very well. And the reason I like it so well is it's, it's, uh, a, you know, it's used appropriately. It's a good balance of, of effective weed control, especially like on mare's tail. It does give us some activity on, on pigweeds, et cetera. It, it's relatively inexpensive. The thing I'll say is, Joe kind of addressed it to some extent. It's, it's, it's very water soluble. So it can look like a hero from one year to a zero the next year. That's why it's really important you use it with other uh, specific sites of action like the ALSs, group twos, with PPOs. It tends to perform better. Guys that want to use just metribuzin in the pre, um, if it's a really wet year, it's probably going to let you down. And then in a dry year, as long as you got the appropriate rate and you, you take Austin's comments to heart as far as soil texture and pH, uh, it can look very, very effective. Um, but it can look like a hero and a zero, just depending on rainfall. Fantastic. Hey, we, uh, we, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Joe. I, I got something to add, too, as far as metribuzin and, and why I yep. think it's, it's a good product that's made a comeback is if we think of maybe growers that have been soybeans on soybeans, that's a way for growers to get a group five um, in there. Another group five on the corn side is atrazine, but growers that are bean on beans, they don't have that option. So if growers are growing beans on beans, metribuzin is a way for them to get a group five, another effective side of action into their soybean program. Fantastic. I'm going to do one last roundtable uh, for general comments, and then we're going to we're going to call this a webinar. Austin, any final comments? Uh, powers in the pre. Uh, so be sure to use multiple sites of action up front uh, to to develop that herbicide plan. Uh, spray on the calendar and not uh, not on the look of the field. So when you have a herbicide plan, follow it. Uh, and and don't go to don't drive up to the field and say I can get another week out of this. If it's 21 to 24 days after you've made your your pre-emerge application, you need to be back in that field. If you're spraying bare dirt, you're doing it right. Luke, uh, hard to top that, but uh, timeliness, timeliness, timeliness. Uh, the little details matter now that uh, resistance is is uh, more frequently than any of us want tank mixing order, tank mixes. Uh, we have so many more sites of action available to us in the pre and to Austin's point, spraying by the calendar. Uh, the, the, the confidence to have a post-spray machine, whether it be your own or somebody you hired, and to get that done timely uh, is becoming more and more prevalent. But really, just the little details are more important than they were five, ten years ago. Joe? Oh, a couple things. So uh, I will take action dot com. I recommend everybody log on there. Um, get, print you off a, a poster of the different premixes. Truly understand on the products that you're picking. You know how many different actives you have out there. How many different groups. And that that poster, hang it up on your shop. It'll really help you out. A great tool to have. And the second thing is. Um, when we're designing that program, try to get as many numbers out there as possible. And like those guys just said, you know, timely applications. And if we're talking about contact and systemic uh, products being put together, so if we're talking about Enlist One and Liberty running a one-to-one -one ratio, 32 ounces, 32 ounces. If we're talking Liberty and glyphosate, once again, one-to-one -one ratio. So we want 
one point one two five pounds. That's the equivalent uh, for every for every thirty two ounces of, of Liberty. So it'd be like a thirty six ounces of Durango to thirty two ounces of Durango uh, to Liberty. So uh, one to one ratio, making sure that. Um, with that systemic product, we have enough in there since it's going to be a little bit slower than the Liberty. So we need to make sure we have enough of that systemic product in there since it's going to be slower than the Liberty. Guys, uh, great job. Thank you for those who joined us today. Um, appreciate all the comments. Uh, there's a question about can you post the link uh, for the site of the tank mix? Can you post the link for that site of the tank mix? Um, if, if, I think if you're addressing takeaction.com, that one. Uh, is that it, Joe? Is it take, takeaction.com? Uh, I, it's Iwilltakeaction.com. Um, it's there you all go. the professors and the universities. We've got other publications out there on different weeds on how to manage it, and a lot of great resources just besides hey, the Jim, poster. Yes, no, say, uh, you're, you're, sorry, Austin. Yeah. I'll... Uh, I'll I'll take a quick a quick minute to plug the the new herbicide brochure right there. Perfect opportunity. Uh, so so Luke talked about it. Uh, Luke has designed a um, a page for the new herbicide book that'll be coming out this year for y'all uh, that specifically talks about tank mix requirements. So I know uh, for this season you definitely need a resource. Uh, but just so you guys know, we're making that herbicide book even better, and that's going to be part of it moving forward. And there you go. Uh, Samantha Miller posted the, the link for the site of the tank mix. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So, all right, uh, Luke, uh, Austin, Joe, thank you very much. You guys, um, you pour your heart and soul into uh, herbicides and weeds, and uh, we are grateful. It's a great resource. This, this uh, webinar was recorded, so once we get it um, transferred into the appropriate format, we will post a link as well. So, uh, Austin, Joe, Luke, thank you very much. Everyone who attended, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, stay safe and have a great weekend. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it very much.